There's an old journalistic uh, maxim, if you want to find the truth, follow the money. In the social sciences, uh, to find the truth of a new social situation, follow the power. So where is the power today? Well, hegemony no longer lies with a reactionary conservative culture. It lies with the marketers and the culture makers in the media. For them, pushing the boundaries is now a marketing technique. Uh, and where once it challenged conservative hegemony, transgression, the holy grail of postmodernism, has now been co-opted by the market. Nowhere is this truer than among the academic apologists for the porn industry, pseudo-radicals trapped in the past, blind to the fact that they have become the pawns of commerce at its most vulgar. The avant-garde has ended up in the caboose. As Zizek has written, perversion is not subversion. Well, the liberation movements of the 60s and 70s seemed to cause the ground to move, to call everything into question. Moral rules became the enemy, and the primary charge was that they served as the means by which dominant groups exercised control over subordinate ones. Straight white males and the institutions they were most closely associated with came under siege from all sides. So overwhelming were the criticisms of the old moral order that a generation led by thinkers such as Foucault and Derrida rejected not just particular moral rules but the legitimacy of morality as such. If so much of the traditional ethical code could be shown to be an arbitrary instrument of oppression, perhaps the whole code was tainted and all ethical rules must be invalid. But there's now an emerging discomfort, I think, with the absence of rules. And nowhere is this more apparent in the arena of sexual mores. The attitude of the sexual revolution, that apart from consent, there are no rules governing sexual behaviour, lifted the constraints on the libido. And this gave permission for sex to be divorced from intimacy, a process that's reached its zenith in recent years. The perilous combination of emotional disengagement and the sexual urge is the theme of Hanif Qureshi's novel Intimacy, which came out several years ago, late 90s, I think. The detachment cultivated uh, by the protagonist in that novel, uh, which incidentally is, it seems to be modelled quite closely on Qureshi's life, according to the um, uh, complaints of uh, his family members. Um, the detachment cultivated by the main character as he prepares to abandon his wife and children is a justification uh, for, the, for a kind of adolescent callousness, or as Qureshi himself writes, a Thatcherism of the soul. We must, he writes, treat other people as if they are real, but are they? We're now beginning to understand that free love exacts a heavy price. One unwittingly exposed by author and libertarian Catherine Millet. The publisher um, described her best selling memoir, The Sexual Life of Catherine M., as a manifesto of our times, where the sexual equality of women is a reality and where love and sex have gone their own separate ways. Is this not precisely what men, in their raw state, have always wanted? to separate copulation from intimacy? Is not every counsellor's room witness to a stream of torn relationships in which she wants more intimacy and he wants more penetration? This is the new uh, democracy of pleasure, in the words of OVD, the French porn star and author who describes herself as a feminist artist and philosopher multi-skilled. The uh, mind boggles, actually. Um, Overdee starred in uh, the mainstream uh, film The Pornographer, of which one critic said, no film in the history of cinema had portrayed oral sex with such a superb sense of existential weariness and melancholy. 
The novels of uh, Michelle Welbeck uh, mirror the turmoil of sexual politics rippling through Western cultures. They've been called pornographic, yet unlike Mie, Welbeck's eroticism has a purpose. For his characters, uh, sex is an antidote to the meaninglessness of modern life. But the novels are also a meditation on that meaning, or lack of it. They are um, a subtle journey into the vain quest for happiness in a post-scarcity world, in which the promises of plenty, and particularly the freedoms won in the 60s and 70s, uh, and he's scathing about uh, uh, the uh, culture of the 60s and 70s, uh, they have left a new barrenness in society. So while Mie is still playing out the fantasies of sexual freedom, Welbeck is warning us of its perils. The sexual revolution, he wrote, was to destroy the last unit separating the individual from the market. Where is all this taking us? It seems to me that as the imperatives for self-creation and individualism reach extreme levels, they're extracting a terrible price. Welbeck's novels are suffused with a sense of the disengagement of the modern project of personal freedom. For all of their casual sex and postmodern nonchalance, the stories remind us of what we sacrifice. In his latest novel, uh, The Possibility of an Island, Welbeck exposes the modern tragedy simply by projecting the trends, current trends forward to a world of radically isolated selves from which the prospect of intense and passionate love has been banished. He takes us in the novel to a secure, closed, affluent, technologically controlled dystopia and considers the possibility of an island that John Donne said no man could be. His work expresses better than any sociological treatise the emptiness that stretches, cavernous, beneath the everyday activity of the consumer existence. Of the young generation, not far into the future, in this novel, he writes, they had reached their goal. At no moment in their lives would they ever know love. They were free. <laughs>